кто помнит, что такое Герои Третье, кто помнит, что такое Bloodlines, для всех, кто знает, что Дисней делает игры, это первый игровой продюсер, который работал на компанию Дисней, первый создавший компанию Афилиант Electronic Arts, человек-легенда, приехал сейчас с вами, но немножко информации перед тем, как он зайдет, чтобы не задерживаться, потом автографы и вопрос, может быть, если кто-то захочет, мы рядом будем раздавать всем желающим автографы. Всем желающим. Вы станете, вот тут столик рядом будет, мы сядем, и все желающие смогут с ним сфотографироваться и получить от него автограф. Если у кого-то не на чем своем, то и у нас будут такие листики специальные от Games Gathering. Поэтому после конференции, ой, после выступления Дэвида не задерживайтесь, занимайте очередь. Может быть, пишите смс, чтобы уже занимали очередь. Но и пишите всем своим друзьям, потому что сейчас для вас выступает самый легендарный из присутствующих здесь разработчиков Дэвид Мюллик. It's great to see so many people here who love playing games and love making games. How many of you have played Heroes of Might and Magic 3? So you've heard of the game? Oh, that's great! That's great! I've heard of it too. Um, I'm here to tell you the story of how it came to be made and what we learned from it. And, but first let me apologize that I only speak English, so I'm sorry that I, don't, I can't speak to you in your native language. But hopefully, we'll still have some fun together. And I'm going to, I have some notes with me. Uh, I also apologize for referring to my notes occasionally. It's been a long, long time since the Hero series started. But I remember most of it. Uh, some parts of it, the early parts of it, I wasn't there for. And but that's because it all started... See if this works. With this man, John Van Canaham. He's the one who created the Heroes of Mind Magic series. In fact, it started for him in 1983. Now, he was someone who loved playing board games. He loved playing Dungeons and Dragons. And he wanted to make games himself. You, you all know that feeling. You probably all grew up loving games and, and wanted to do it yourselves. Well, so did he. And He started a game studio in 1983, New World Computing, with his wife and his friend Mark Caldwell, and he went to make his very first game. Started out of his apartment, and it took him three years, and this was the game he made. Might and Magic Book One, The Secret of the Inner Sanctum. So this was a, this was a role-playing game, And you controlled six different heroes. And you would march through a dungeon. And even though it had a lot of elements of fantasy in it, it had wizards and a, and a, a sort of medieval world you explore around in, and you go in dungeons, and you fight monsters, and you use magic within it. It was actually set in a, sci in a, in a world called Varn, V-A-R-N. And that actually stood for, this is where I have to refer to my notes because I, I don't have it memorized. It stood for, Varn, stood for um, Vehicular Astropod Research Nacelle. And really what this, 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 fantasy, this uh, fantasy world was actually set in a biosphere, which is an artificial environment, aboard a spaceship. And he was inspired by an uh, episode of the original S Star Trek series uh, in which an alien race was had set up a world in which there were uh, uh, Native American Indians in it. And they didn't realize that they were being, being controlled or the world had been set up by aliens. So that was his inspiration for the, uh, for the game. And... Uh, It was, it was inspired by both his love for fantasy and science fiction. And as you can tell, he knew ahead of time that he wanted to create 
a whole set of games based on this world because it was called Mind Magic Book One. And eventually uh, got turned into the, uh, the uh, Mind Magic role playing game series. It did well. It sold over 100,000 copies in 1989, which is really good for that time. And uh, it got praised by critics. It was uh, praised because of the player had a lot of freedom of exploration in the world. Uh, it, was, it was innovative in that the player's gender and race and uh, alignment played into the game's storyline. That hadn't been done much before. Um, it had a lot of content behind it. Uh, but as good as it was, he had, he had problems finding distribution for it. I mean, he made a great game, but he had problems finding a publisher to actually sell it. I'm sure a lot of you have experienced that problem. You're making this great game, and you can't find anyone to take it on and sell it for you. So he decided to distribute it himself, and so he formed New World Computing as his own distributor. And, uh, but uh, once he did release it, it was, it was uh, very much appreciated by critics, and again, it sold well. And in fact, uh, in uh, the year after it was released, in, in 1994, Computer Gaming World named it the 23rd best game of all time. Not too bad for your very first game. Well, several years later, and here again I have to refer to my notes, he made a game, ah, 1990. Uh, this was at the, a game called King's Bounty, and it was, uh, it was New World Computing's fourth game they've made. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was designed by John and uh, programmed by his, uh, by his partner, Mark uh, Caldwell. And it was a tactical-based role-playing game in which you controlled a hero, and you were sent on a, uh, on a quest uh, to recover... Uh, Recover, what is the name of the artifact? The Scepter of the Order. And you're sent on this quest by King Maximus, and you had a limited amount of time to find the scepter before it died, uh, before he died. And you'd explore the, explore the territory, and, uh, and you'd have to recover pieces of a map, I think 24 different pieces, in order to eventually find it. And what you would do is you would control the hero, and that hero had a number of different army units or creature units uh, that, uh, that fought for the hero. And you would go around uh, and weekly be assigned to capture different villains. And you would collect a bounty, the king's bounty, on each, on each villain that you defeated. And as you collected the bounty, you'd raise an experience. But it had a lot of, uh, lot of elements that we see in, uh, in the Heroes series in that you did control a uh, hero, and that hero had a number of different, uh, different creatures fighting, uh, fighting on the hero's behalf. And even though this, this game got kind of mixed reviews, it was known as being the inspiration for the Heroes of Might Magic series, the forerunner of it. And for that reason, we often refer to King's Bounty as Heroes of Might Magic Zero. It wasn't until five years later, though, that we had our, our first real Heroes of Mind Magic game. It was called Heroes of Mind Magic, A Strategic Quest. And it was a turn-based strategy game that had some uh, role-playing game elements. And in this game, uh, you had four different heroes. And they were, the, they were uh, four hero classes. There were two might heroes which were uh, the knight and the barbarian, and two magic heroes, a sorceress and a warlock. And of course, the, uh, the, the, uh, the might heroes were, were very good at attack and defense, and the magic heroes were very good at spell casting. And uh, this was, this was uh, set in the, the might magic universe, uh, the, the same universe that the might magic role-playing games were based upon. And in it, uh, it used a lot of the characters that, uh, that we found in the, the Heroes of Mind Magic role-playing, uh, uh, sorry, the Mind Magic role-playing game. Uh, and it told the story of Lord Morgan Iron Fist, who uh, had to flee his homeland through a magic portal because his, his cousin Ragnar 
had usurped the throne and uh, killed his father. So he, has, he finds himself in a strange land with few followers and therefore has a number of heroes who actually were, were more generals that would lead armies and try to reclaim the land for him. Um, again, it, it had a lot of elements from King's Bounty, but it incorporated many more adventure and simulation and war game elements. And in fact, the, the, uh, it, the game was praised for having all these different elements work so well together. Um, and then, uh, then also it, uh, uh, the, the graphics being all very bright and colorful also earned a lot of praise. Uh, Although uh, its storyline, a lot of critics thought the storyline was a little bit weak. It's, it sold well, sold uh, 100,000 units, and uh, Computer Gaming World named it in 1996 the 133rd best computer game ever created. So not number one, not number 10, but still, by that time, 133, not too bad. It was good enough that he decided to make a sequel to it. So in 1996, they put together a larger team. Uh, it still had John Van Canham as the designer, Phil Steinmeier as the main programmer, Julie Yolano as the artist, and they created Heroes and Might Magic to the Succession Wars, which used essentially the same gameplay as the original Heroes of Might and Magic, and in fact, use, use this, uh, the same code they built upon it. Um, but they, uh, they added a couple more uh, hero classes. They added in the nec Necromancer and, uh, and uh, the, uh, the Wizard Factions. They also changed the, uh, changed the uh, way magic worked in the original Heroes of Might and Magic. You, uh, you could use spells a certain number of times before you would forget them, then you'd have to go back to your town and, uh, and uh, go, go back and memorize, uh, memorize them again. And for Heroes 2, they changed the magic system so that you, uh, you had a number of spell points that you could expend on doing spells, so you wouldn't have to be constantly returning back to your home castle. And... Uh, there was something about this game, it just, every, even though it was essentially like Heroes, the, Heroes 1, Heroes 2, all the elements worked together so well that, uh, that it really was the breakout game in the series. And uh, PC Game Magazine named it the sixth best PC game ever created. So one of the, uh, one of the best um, games of all time. And this is where I enter the picture. So, like John Van Canham, he and I were both born in Los Angeles. We were both science fiction and fantasy fans. Um, I, was a, um, I, was a, I was a hugely influenced by Lord of the Rings. And uh, when I was in college, I joined a Lord of the Rings uh, cosplay group. I, I was the group's Legolas. Didn't have a beard at the time. Thank you. And we attended a lot of events together. I, I, I thought I had a, a slide here with a, with, a, with a picture of me as Legolas on it, but uh, that is, seems not to have made into the version I brought with me. But yeah, I was hugely influenced by fantasy. In fact, later, I, uh, when the uh, Lord of the Rings films came out, I was so obsessed with them that uh, I wrote a lot about them on the internet, comparing uh, all the clues we got about the making of the film against the uh, actual stories, and I became uh, one of the Internet's greatest experts on the differences between the books and the films. Uh, also, like John, John Van Canham, I was hugely influenced by Star Trek. And when I went to school, uh, went to college, I knew I wanted to do storytelling, just like all the stories I loved in science fiction and fantasy. I couldn't decide whether to be a writer or an artist or a filmmaker, I was a little bit afraid to be either because I thought I wouldn't be able to make money at a job like that. So I decided to try something more practical. I took a whole bunch of different classes in university, and I wound up taking a, uh, 
a programming class, and while I was, uh, while, while I was in the computer lab waiting to use the shared printer to print out my homework assignment, I started typing out a Star Trek game. And as it was working, it was, a, it was, a, it was a, a tactical game, much like classic Star Trek games, where you controlled the spaceship and you moved it around in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, a, a space environment set up as a two-dimensional space that you moved around in, avoiding Klingons, and you, you controlled shields and phasers and photon torpedoes, and a lot of it was about balancing your energy between those different elements. But as I was creating this game, I started realizing that the player was creating their own story by playing the game. But unlike watching a movie or reading a book, it was the player's decisions that affected the outcome of the story. So that essentially the player was the writer of the story that they were participating in. And that got me all excited about the idea of interactive fiction. And I got so excited about the idea, I immediately went and changed my major to computer science. And, uh, and started studying computers. And about a year later, one of my programming professors caught me using the university computer to print out pictures of starships and generate poetry randomly. And he called me into his office. I thought I was going to get into trouble. But no, he offered me a job. He and a couple of the other professors had opened the, uh, the, uh, one of the very first computer stores ever to uh, open in Los Angeles. They sold Apple computers. And he offered me a job as a clerk in his store. And I started working there. And uh, doing that job, I met, met a couple of the very first game publishers. And one of them asked me to create some, uh, uh, if I'd be interested in, uh, in writing some games for them to publish. And I said, yes, please. And so that's, that's how I embarked on my career as a, uh, as a game developer. And it was, it was a pretty successful career. These are some of the early games I was best known for. My, my first, I'd say my, my earliest hit was called The Prisoner, based upon a British television series about a spy who's captured and taken to a remote village where they try to trick him, trick him into revealing why he resigned from his job. And so I created a game that was very much based upon that. Uh, it was uh, known for being very evil in trying to trick the player into, uh, into revealing uh, why they resigned. And uh, to, to simulate that in the game environment, I gave the, the player a randomly generated code that they were never to acknowledge. Uh, they would never to type that number. They would never make any selection containing that number. And I think the, uh, the trickiest part of the game is that uh, while you're playing the game, it would have, the, the game would suddenly appear to crash. And it would say, error at line number, and give the line number that, of the code that it crashed at. And any Apple user at that time would be tempted to write down list and then the line number, which would show them uh, the, the line number of the code where it crashed at. But it turned out the crash was not real, and that line number was our resignation code. And if they actually typed it out, they would lose the game. So that, that was, it was uh, the game was also known for, in addition to little tricks like that, uh, it had a, uh, a, uh, uh, a natural language parser. You would communicate to it by typing in words to it. And at that time, it was, it was considered very advanced. The game became sort of a, a cult classic. Uh, and then after that, uh, I made a, uh, a science fiction role-playing game called Empire One World Builders, which was first in a series. Uh, not many people remember it today. Uh, it, uh, Electronic Games Magazine named it the best science fiction fantasy game of the year. A few years after that, I, uh, d I had my own company called Electric Transit. We did simulations that uh, taught people uh, useful knowledge and skills. We did a, a wilderness survival simulation that developed with a couple of NASA JPL scientists that earned a number of different awards. It was also one of the very first games distributed by Electronic Arts uh, as with us being its, uh, an affiliated publisher for us. Ga uh, even though the game won a lot of awards, uh, 
we ran into the problem that Electronic Arts made a lot of their mistakes, first mistakes as a publisher, on us. They, uh, they overestimated the number of orders and their, uh, the, that they wanted. Therefore, we overproduced copies of the game and, that they couldn't sell. And so that got us to a financial uh, problem that drove us out of business. But that didn't, that didn't uh, ruin my uh, career in the game industry. I went and joined uh, uh, the Walt Disney Company as its very first video game producer. And I made a number of games, including DuckTales The Quest for Gold, which was based upon the DuckTales TV series. How many of you have seen that series? All right, good. Good, all right. So you know what I'm talking about. DuckTales, woo! <laughs> and this told the story of, uh, of Scrooge McDuck versus Flintheart Glomgold, his arch nemesis, trying to... Uh, they were in a contest to earn as much gold as possible. I, I did the main game design on it. I worked with an outside team called Incredible Technologies that, did a, uh, that designed a lot of the individual adventures you'd go on. Uh, and the uh, uh, game did very well. I think it was uh, one of the most popular games that Disney did in that era. And then I, uh, after I uh, spent four years at Disney, and then I went and joined another company that was very undisney like it was called Cyber Dreams, and it worked with famous names from science fiction, fantasy, and horror. We worked with, uh, I worked with uh, Wes Craven, the director of Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, developing a horror game uh, that based upon his concept. Worked with H.R. Giger, the artist who uh, is known for designing the alien from the film Alien on a game called, uh, called Dark Sea 2. But the uh, most successful game at that time I, I had was, uh, was I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream, based upon Harlan Ellison's short story. And uh, I worked with Harlan on developing the story for that, and I, I uh, turned, uh, turned the storyline into actual playable puzzles in, in, an, in an adventure game format. And this game did very well, won a lot of awards. Around this time, I was invited over to the uh, Computer Game Developers Conference in San Francisco uh, by uh, Soft Talk Magazine that had put together a, famous pan a panel of famous game designers. Uh, they wanted me to talk about The Prisoner, because at the time that was probably my most famous game, uh, and they were big fans of it. But they also brought together Jordan Mechner, who was the uh, designer of Prince of Persia, Sid Meier, the designer of Civilization, Don Deglo, who's one of the most successful game producers in the industry, and John Van Canaham. And uh, we, we talked on the panel, we, we, we talked to other game industry professionals about game design. And afterwards, John and I started talking together and we said, you know, we ought to work together sometime. Sure, sure, you know, but, you know it's a type of conversation you have all the time with people. We, we ought to work together, yeah, one day we'll do it, and that day never comes. Well, that day did come. Uh, a former, uh, uh, a former uh, programmer who worked uh, worked on uh, "I Have No Mouth and Must Scream" contacted me when uh, when uh, uh, Cyber Dreams shut down. It shut down because the uh, the owner of the company realized that he was making more money on his other companies than he was on on uh, video games. And uh, the programmer said, "They're looking for a producer for the next." Heroes of Mind Magic and New World Computing. Would you mind sending me your resume and I'll submit you as a candidate? So I did. And they called me back and I met with uh, John Van Canham and Mark Caldwell. And we had a lunch together and they asked me to go and play Heroes of Mind Magic 2 and to see if I'd be interested in creating the sequel for it. And, uh, you know, that's an exciting proposition, but it's also a scary one because here is a Mind Magic 2. As I said, PC Magazine had named it the sixth best PC game of all time. I couldn't possibly do better than that. I could only fail. That was my big fear because I, I sat down and played it for a week, and there was just no way I could improve on the gameplay. But I looked at it, and I looked at the graphics, and I thought, the graphics, they're, they're cute, they're charming, they're colorful, but they're, they're about five years behind the time. And I thought, 
the graphics could be much improved. So I thought that would be my main contribution to it. At least it, graphically, it would, it, would, it would look better than the previous one. And uh, so I went back to them, and I, said, I went back to John and Mark, and I said, I'll do that. I'll, 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 I'll produce the next one for you, but uh, I want to improve the graphics. And they said, I'm glad you said that, because we're kind of unhappy with our art director, and, but she's been with us a long time, and we don't want to, don't want to get rid of her, so we want you to find a, a new art director for it. So I said, okay. And so they, they said, there's one more, more thing you have to do. You have to talk to the head of our company. New World Computing had been bought out the year before by the 3DO company, who was presided over by Trip Hawkins. Now, how many of you know who Trip Hawkins is? All right, I only see a couple of hands up. At the time, he was considered the most powerful person in the video game industry because he was the founder of Electronic Arts, which at the time was the biggest, uh, biggest video game publisher there was. And, uh, but after a few years of Electronic Arts, he wanted to create his own video game console that was, would be a next generation console. And it was called the 3DO Player. But instead of manufacturing it, what he would do is create the design for it and then get other companies like Panasonic to actually do the manufacturing. Now the problem is when you, uh, when you have somebody else do the manufacturing, they want to make a profit. And then his company, 3DO, his new company for making the console, they wanted to make a, uh, they need to make a profit too. So when you have two companies working together, both trying to make a profit, it made the console very, very expensive. And while everyone agreed that it was a really good console, it was just too expensive, far more expensive than the Nintendo and the Sega systems that were out there. So it never sold very well, and they eventually stopped making it, and he focused on doing what he knew best, which was being a software publisher. Um, but he had bought uh, New World Computing to, to add to his library, and in fact, New World Computing games sold better than, uh, than uh, the, uh, the games that they made at 3DO corporate offices. Anyway, I was, uh, with all New World em uh, employees, we had to go, uh, the higher level ones, we had to go through an interview with, with Trip. And uh, so they set up an interview time with me. My, uh, we just had a, a newborn baby, and my wife was away on an errand. And I'd put down the baby for a nap when it was time for me to talk to Trip. And so he called me up and started talking to me and talking to me and talking to me all about how great his company was and how great he was and how every single great idea in video games came from him. And during that time, he did not ask me one question. He just talked about him for two hours. Now, my baby had started waking up like an hour, a half hour prior and was crying, and I kept saying, I, I can't hang up on the most powerful person in the video game industry. But eventually I said, I, I, I got to go. I'm, I, I got to see my baby. I said, oh, okay, okay. So I, I put down the phone and got to my uh, got, took care of my baby. But I got the job. He, he gave a stamp of approval. And so I went to work for New World Computing in September 1997. And on that same day, they had, uh, they had hired Greg Fulton to be the lead designer on it. He and I had never met before. I knew nothing about him. We started on the same day. Fortunately, we hit it off. And uh, we became great friends. He had previously worked at Activision and uh, I, for, I forget some other company, but he wasn't that very well known. He didn't have that many hit titles. But uh, he became my lead designer. My next task was to find an art director because, again, they were unhappy with their current art director. So what I decided to do, I, I went down, I had a meeting with every single artist at New World Computing. There were like 25 artists there. And I sat down for five minutes with each one. 
And they were all pretty much the same. They liked being here. It was a pretty easy job. You could go. You really didn't have to do anything until like the final two weeks of the project, and that's when management started to get real, real anxious, and then you had to do a lot of work. But the rest of the time, you could kind of goof off. And one by one, they all told me this uh, same story until we got, I got to the last person, Phelan Sykes, who told me that everything here was really crappy. All the artists were lazy, the artwork was bad, they could do a lot better if only someone made them want to work better. And I thought, I found my art director. <laughs> As it turned out, I didn't, I didn't even know it. She was the best artist in the company. So I brought her on to be the art director. And then they did give me an employee to be my programmer, George Ruoff, who had worked on Heroes of My Magic 2. He wasn't the main programmer, Phil Steinmeier was, but he had done some programming on it. And uh, so I thought he had a lot of expertise on it. After a couple of weeks, though, I discovered he was a very, very, very junior programmer. Uh, and he wasn't up to the task. In fact, he was, uh, I, I could only give him very low-level programming duties. So I had to find a, uh, a, a new art director, uh, sorry, a new, new lead programmer, and so I reached back to my Cyber Dreams days and brought in a programmer who had worked on I Have No Mouth and Must Scream, and that's John Bolton. And I've got to apologize for these photographs. I have almost no photographs from the New World Computing era. So this is, this is Greg from several years before he joined New World, and that's Phelan from about 20 years after New World. And this is, uh, this is from a group photo with John from way in the back. But anyway, these people formed my core team. And we all got along great with each other. And I think that's the main reason why Heroes 3 was a success, is that the art and the programming and the design all worked very well together because we as a team all worked well together. On the design side, we, uh, we, made, we basically used the, the, the same system as, as Heroes of My Magic 2. Uh, we decided the direction we'd go in is we'd add more content to it. So we increased the town types from 6 to 8 by adding a couple new character classes. Uh, more creatures uh, they could control. A lot more heroes. And each one of those had a special ability. Uh, Instead of having separate magic and, and might towns, each town would have uh, magic and might heroes associated with it. Uh, we, uh, we changed the magic system so that it had a number of different schools of magic. Um, we added in war machines for combat. In the previous heroes, you just had a catapult for, uh, for breaking down castle walls. But we added, a, we added a, a war wagon and a number of different other other. Uh, machines you could buy. And then, uh, and then we added an underground level to it. So instead of just wandering around the surface of the earth, there were also tunnels underneath it we could go. So it, it was basically the same game, but a lot more content. A few more choices um, uh, that the player had to make. But whenever you add new content to a game, Anything new you add could take what, you, take what you already had and unbalance it. So balancing became a great issue. And uh, the way we went about it is that uh, uh, Greg would go and meet with John Van Canham. They, they'd go into uh, John's office and meet for, they'd have, four hour, uh, they'd have meetings that would last like four hours long every couple of days just to balance creatures. And what Greg did was, well, they first sat down and kind of figured out, based on intuition, how these uh, creatures should rank with each other, all the, all the different creatures the heroes could, uh, could control. And they, um, they, they figured out how, what their attributes should be. And then uh, Greg put together a spreadsheet that would take all their different attributes and generate one number that kind of gave the, the, each creature's relative strength. And that would uh, tell them whether or not uh, they, uh, that 
whether or not the results of their, 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 their adjusting of the different creatures' attributes really put, uh, put the creature in the power level they wanted. So first based upon intuition, then using mathematics to, to kind of validate what it is that they guessed. And then uh, after that, our, uh, our, uh, once they, they balanced each of the creatures, came up with the numbers they wanted, then, uh, then those results were given to, uh, to Gus Smedstad, who was our AI programmer. And he'd make further adjustments. He'd, he'd go and put these creatures in and do a, he'd create a Bennett battle simulator and have each one fight against each other. And so test it out whether or not indeed each one, uh, each one was, uh, was, was the right power level. And, and, and tweak things where, where things didn't work out right. And finally, as far as spells and, uh, and magic artifacts go, in terms of balancing, John and, and Greg mostly use their intuition about uh, what their different attributes should be. So a little bit, little bit of uh, intuition, a little bit of science behind the balancing of it. Um, so uh, we, we thought the design was coming together really well, but we didn't have total harmony in our group. Our programmer, George, who had worked on Heroes of Might Magic 2, came into my office, and uh, he was practically crying, and he told me that we were ruining the Heroes of Might Magic series with our changes. And he said every single change that we were making to it made it worse. And in fact, whenever we had design sessions, and he came to them, uh, he would always just complain about what we were doing and tell us how it was awful. So uh, not, even though I, I was worried that about making a game that, that, that wouldn't suck compared to Heroes of My Magic 2, I knew I couldn't have such a negative influence on my team. So I, I took George and put him in a separate office all by himself and uh, you know, get, visit him once a week, hear your assignments, and then you know, get his stuff back. But uh, it's real important to have a team that works well together. If you do have somebody for whatever reason dragging down the rest of the team, uh, you either get rid of them or find a way to minimize their effect. We, we still had the need of, of this programmer, but again, to minimize his uh, negative influence, I, I separated him from the rest of the team. Um, he wasn't the only one who, who, who would uh, complain about our design. I get a lot of complaints now about Eagle Eye, <laughs> one of the spells in the game. Uh, so often in interviews, or every once in a while in interviews, uh, by, by fan sites, they'll ask, why did you put Eagle Eye into the game? It sucks as a spell. So this is a spell that uh, the way it works is that if you have, if you, if, or, or this is one of the hero's abilities, if you have this ability, and you're in combat, you have a small percentage chance of, get, of learning one of the weaker spells from your opponent. And so uh, it wasn't all that useful. So I, in response to this, I have to say, I know. <laughs> I've heard it a lot. Yes, I know you think Eagle Eye sucks. We didn't invent it. It came from Heroes of My Magic 2. <laughs> we, just, we just brought it over. And you know what? It's OK in a game to have some things that are underpowered. Much better than having things that are overpowered. Because with overpowered items, somebody can win a game too easily, which cuts short the fun. Underpowered stuff, you just don't use. And that's OK. It's OK to have content that the player doesn't use. So enough about Eagle Eye. Not everything can be great. One thing I think we did do great was uh, improving the art. So this is sort of like, well, this is what a goblin creature looked like in Heroes of My Magic 2. And uh, what I wanted to do to improve the art, the expression I used was extreme fantasy. I wanted something grittier, uh, darker to the artwork. And I used Warhammer as my main influence. And so what I would do is, uh, in order to, uh, to get the artists to change their art style, I, uh, I went and, and collected a whole bunch of fantasy illustrations from different artists. And I'd find creatures that looked like how I wanted them to look. And I'd, for, for each creature type, I'd gather 
three, four, or five different photographs so that, uh, that, that would illustrate, in general, what I was looking after. I, I didn't want there to be just one, one, one uh, image because I didn't want them to copy that image exactly. Uh, I wanted to influence the artist. So uh, uh, I, I put together an art Bible of all different looks, and, uh, and uh, that way got them to, to, uh, to, to change from their cartoony look to cartoony look to the look I wanted to go after. Now, that required a lot of work in getting the team to change. Sometimes change comes slowly, and there was a lot of graphics in Heroes 3 to change. In fact, there were over 10,000 individual graphics I think we created. That's the number that stuck into my mind. Maybe it was, higher, maybe it was probably somewhere between 10 and 30,000 individual pieces of graphics in the game. So that's a lot of work, even alert work to do, even with a large art team. Um, and we didn't have forever to work on it. We, were, we, we had a deadline we had to ship by. So what I decided to do to both improve the quality but not make sure that we weren't taking too long is that we formed a jury of myself, art director uh, Phelan Sykes, and assistant art director Rebecca Reel. And we review each piece of artwork in the game but we would, it would take two of us to reject it. So that way it wasn't just based on one person's individual taste about whether or not to accept a piece of artwork. So that way we both had an emphasis on quality without, uh, without having personal opinion. One person's opinion uh, caused too many things to be redone. We also put in, uh, put in some cutscenes. Uh, the story involved our, uh, uh, the main story involved our hero, Catherine, who is trying to reclaim the continent of Arathia, restore it. Uh, we, uh, we had an outside company called Cyberlore do, uh, do the, uh, do the cutscenes for us. We, uh, we did, uh, we created the models they used. We, uh, we supervised the motion capture behind it. We wrote the script for it. And uh, it all came to very, together very well. I'm, uh, I'm very happy that we had a, a female lead character, although looking back now, 20 years later, I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed by the armor we put her in. Uh, that, that sort of thing would not fly today. Uh, it is not practical, and uh, uh, we, 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 looking back, I wish we had done a better job at, at representing women in the game. All right, here's... Here's, an, here's one problem with the artwork. Um, I hear some of you laughing. You, you know what the word fecal means? If you don't know what the word fecal means, this, this image would tell you. Um, we, we have a lot of user interface elements in the game. And John Van Canaham told us that he liked the brown color for the graphics. So everything in the game was brown, 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 sort of this color brown. And so we tended to call it the artwork as being painted with the fecal brush. We didn't like the look, but it came from John Van Canaham, who's the chief designer of the company. Well, we created a lot of user interface elements. Uh, Scott White was our user interface ar artist, and he was just amazing. He could really just churn all these buttons and icons and frames out. Um, and he did a ton of work. But uh, about three months before we were going to ship, Mark Cardwell, the, uh, the general manager, said, I don't like the brown. I want there to be color in the game. And we said, but it came from John. And he said, I don't care what John says. We're going to put color in. And that, that was his biggest creative contribution, and he's the one person brave enough to do it. So in the last, moment, last couple of months of the game, we had Scott redo all of his user, user interfaces so that the different players could have uh, uh, different colors for their character, and that there'd be different color accents to all the artwork. So it changed from everything all being brown to, uh, to having different color accents in the artwork. And the only reason we were able to do that is that Scott had created 
all the, uh, all the user interface elements in different layers of Photoshop. And so to change the colors, he just had to change that one layer in the Photoshop files. But there was a lot of Photoshop files to do. He was a very busy man for a couple of months uh, changing all the artwork. As far as programming goes, we basically use the game engine that Phil Steinmeier created. Uh, we did have a number of other programmers who worked on the project uh, to add in additional features to it or improve the features that were there. There is a story. Normally, I want to tell it because it's kind of an embarrassing one. But uh, I, I think uh, some, somebody on the team already told this story, so I'll, I'll share it with you. Right before we were, uh, while we were working on Heroes of Mind Magic, Pop Top Software was coming out with a sequel to uh, Sid Meier's uh, great game, Railroad Tycoon, what I consider to be one of the greatest strategy games of all time. But Pop Top Software got the rights to do a sequel to it, and uh, they didn't have Sid involved in it. Instead, they hired Phil Steinmeier, the programmer on Heroes and Heroes 2, to both design because he fancied himself as a game designer. He actually claimed to have co-designed Heroes of My Magic 2. Uh, when John Vicanaham hears that, he laughs. Uh, he had some suggestions. He did not design the game. But uh, Phil designed Railroad Tycoon 2. And uh, about a month before it was to come out, they released a demo of it. So we were curious to see what Phil had done. So we, uh, we downloaded the demo, and we looked at it, and we said, you know, kind of the movement of characters in it looks a lot like how the horses move in Heroes of My Magic 2. And some of the scroll bars look quite a bit like the, uh, the scroll bars in Heroes of My Magic 2. So, uh, so George, our programmer, decompiled the code and saw a lot of Heroes 2 references in it. And uh, Phil had used the game engine he created for uh, Heroes of My Magic 2. The problem with that is that the engine was New World Computing's property. And so uh, uh, Mark Caldwell, our general manager, had 3 Do's lawyers contact PopTop Software and said, you are using our intellectual property without permission, and we are going to sue you. Now, this was a month before they were going to release a major title. So uh, this was quickly settled out of court for an undisclosed sum. I hear rumors is for over a million dollars. Um, word of warning to you, copyright is a real thing. Be careful about using anyone else's intellectual property, whether that be music, sound effects, audio recordings, code, art, without the creator's permission. Uh, because uh, copyright infringement can be a real thing, and it certainly was a real thing for uh, PopTop Software. Another person that, uh, that doesn't get nearly enough credit for Heroes of My Magic 2 success is David Ritchie, who programmed our map, map editor. I think the fact that uh, uh, it was originally created to help our, uh, our, uh, our level design teams create a, a, a lot of maps and give them a lot of options, they could control just about everything on a map. Uh, what creatures would, would be randomly generated, what range of randomly creatures, where artifacts were, they could put in story elements to it. Uh, it was just an incredible amount of detail. And uh, whenever the uh, level designer wanted to do something that the map editor couldn't do, they would meet with David, and he'd go and put in that feature for them. So it was a, a very, very um, powerful map editor, and it's one that we made to our, uh, made available to uh, all, uh, our, all of our players so that they could create their own maps. Uh, we had a good level design team, well, great level design team, and uh, the main focus on all of our maps was strategy comes first. That is, you make a map that's fun and challenging to play by putting in all the right items, the right places for the, the goal of each map, put in the proper level of challenges, 
put in strategic elements like the place of where you place the resources, where you place uh, mountains and forests to create choke points. Uh, I'll focus on the strategy. Story is secondary. Story has always been important to the Mind Mag Heroes of My Magic series, but it's still secondary to the strategy. So strategy had to come first, story second. And then once the level designers created the map, we'd bring them, we'd send them over to an artist who would add in beauty elements to it that, uh, you know, like uh, uh, plants and, and additional other uh, landscape elements to it that, would, uh, that wouldn't affect gameplay. There's one other element that I didn't mention, and I'm really embarrassed for that. I was, I was hoping to put it in my slideshow. That was the music behind the game. So... I know some of you are familiar with, with uh, Paul Romero, who created the music for the game. Yeah. Right? He's, he's, done a number of, uh, he's done a number of Heroes concerts. He did the music in Heroes of My Magic 2, as well as Heroes of My Magic 3. I think he's given a concert next year. Uh, believe it or not, I've never met him, even though he worked on our team. I actually, who I would deal with was our music producer, Rob King, who supervised not only creation of the music, but also the sound effects and the voiceover recordings for all the videos. I would, I would, I would meet with Rob, and I'd tell him what I wanted in terms of length and whether or not things would repeat, and most importantly, what is the emotional feeling that I wanted a player to have on different terrains or in different situations. So... Um, I, I also supervised uh, the creation of the scripts for the voiceover recordings, uh, put together lists of audios, and uh, he told me later that he liked, he liked a lot working with me, with me because I was very clear about what I wanted, and I knew how to talk. Even though I'm, 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 I don't know much about music, I know about player experience, and I know what I wanted the player to experience. So I would communicate to him emotions. And uh, that worked, worked very well with creating the, uh, the, uh, creating the music for the game. So Rob would go and meet with, uh, with Paul and tell him what I wanted for the music. And he created and did, a, again, a fantastic job in Heroes 3, just like he did with Heroes of My Magic 2. So there were a lot of people to manage in this process. And uh, so we used, uh, we used a Gantt chart for keeping track of everything, what everyone was doing. And I worked together with our lead programmer, John Bolton, on putting together, uh, putting together a schedule for this. And we realized that the project overall would take us 14 months to do. But when I went to meet with our general manager, Mark Cowell, about it, he said, no, that's not acceptable. It, it needs to be done in 12 months. And I said, I'm sorry, it's, it's going to take 14. With the level of people we have, it will take 14 months to do. And he said, okay, I'll make a deal with you. You'll do it in 12 months. What kind of deal is that? All right, Mark, we'll do it in 12 months. We did it in 14 months, just like I predicted. So we released it, and we didn't fail. I didn't embarrass myself. It, uh, it got great reviews. Some people say it's better than Heroes of My Magic 2. Some people think Heroes of My Magic 2 is better. That's okay, they're, they're different games. I'm just proud that we didn't embarrass ourselves. So I thought it was a big success. At least critics and fans seem to think it was a big success. And I attribute it again to the balance in the game, both in terms of the, the story, the music, the design working well together, in the background, the programmer, artists, and, and designers all working well together, level designers, everyone working well together. Uh, great balance between story and strategy. Uh, even though story, strategy uh, took pre precedence, story did a good job of supporting it. Uh, yeah, I, 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 if there's one secret be behind this game, it's balance. But not everyone agreed that we did a good job. Actually, George, the programmer, he turned around and realized that, that we hadn't ruined the, uh, the, uh, the, the franchise with it. But uh, when it came time for my annual review with, with my boss, Mark, he called me into his office, and I went in, thought I'd be getting a medal or something for, for making a, a, a good game. His first words out of his mouth was, well, 
I'm not going to fire you. And I, I laughed. I thought it was a joke. Now, he wasn't joking. He said, I'm not going to fire you, but I'm unhappy with the job you did. I said, why? And he said, well, I think you were too controlling over the project. You ordered people too much. And uh, from now on, I want you to give everyone else more creative control. And, uh, uh, and I don't think you work with the artists very well. And uh, I, was, I was shocked after that. Uh, I thought, in fact, I thought my relationship with the artist was great. My relationship with everyone was, was great. But uh, that kind of, that unsettled me. And I, I lost confidence uh, uh, afterwards. Especially when I wanted to work on the Forge Town. So the Forge Town was something we were going to put in our next expansion, for the, our first expansion for the game, Armageddon's Blade. And in that expansion, uh, we were taking a lead for what was happening in Mind Magic 7. In Mind Magic 7, we revealed that actually uh, our fantasy world was being controlled by aliens and that all the fantasy creatures were really creations of them created by the Cosmic Forge. And so since in Heroes, we've always followed the storyline of the previous, hero, uh, previous Mind Magic role-playing game, we decided to incorporate that into our expansion. And so we wanted to put in a, a new town, the Forge Town, that would have different types of creatures. And we would put in uh, science fiction elements and combine them with the fantasy elements. So we would have dwarves with ray guns and minotaurs that had jetpacks and nagas that were, on, that were in tanks. And we thought was, that would be pretty cool. Now, I wanted to, uh, I thought that uh, the look of this town should, be, should have kind of a Jules Verne type of science fiction look to it. Uh, something that was uh, more steampunk. Because that had a little bit of fantasy element. It would be too jarring for our Heroes fans. Phelan, on the other hand, she was supporting a more, uh, more uh, German expressionistic look, sort of a, a more World War II, uh, metropolis kind of look to the game. So she and I disagreed, and I remember what Mark told me about me being too controlling. So I, w I, said, I went to my designer, Greg, and said, you decide, and he chose Phelan's look. So this is, this is the look we created for the town. And then we, uh, we, we, we had our uh, concept artist, George, George Allman, create a series of concept sketches for the different creatures in the town. And um, the way George drew things, they weren't quite, uh, he tended to add more physical anatomy to our, uh, to our creatures than, than uh, we'd, uh, we'd actually put into the game. Uh, he, he's a classically trained artist, so he, he, uh, he likes uh, drawing figures that have kind of classical looks to them. And, uh, and, you know, we, we knew that our, that our artists would create the models, would go and, and make them more family-friendly family friendly looking. Uh, when, uh, when our marketing department came by and said, we, we need to start advertising what you're going to do, can you give us some sample of our work to show to some friends? I just went into George's office and, and picked up some sample artwork and said, here, you guys choose what you want to show off. And what they decided to show off was the Naga tank. And as soon as that was published, our fans, our most loyal fans, were outraged. How dare we mix fantasy and science fiction? That's not heroes. Even though that's part of the world that we're in. Uh, that's part of the mind magic universe. And how dare us not be family friendly? And they immediately launched a boycott of the game. They said they were not going to do, do buy the expansion when it came out. And even though I thought we could pull it off, we could do something that they would trust, um, our uh, management 3DO said, cancel it. Do something different. So we gave in and uh, came up with a conflict town instead, which was based upon elemental units, much more colorful kind of had that Jules Vernish look I was going after, and that was probably for the best. 
Another thing to come out of, uh, out of this expansion is this guy, Sir Moloch. So this came about uh, uh, after I had come back from vacation. My second son was born at this time, and so I left for a week for, maternity, for a paternity leave. And when I came back, I found my office all filled with balloons from the team. And they came in and said, we have another surprise for you. We hope you don't get too mad about it. So they brought me over a computer, and they showed me Sir Mullock. Generally stoic, Sir Mullock is prone to spasmodic fits of uncoordinated excitement, believed to intimidate his troops into working harder. So they were poking fun at me at being uh, the leader of the team. And I looked at it, and I laughed, and I said, okay, you can put this in the game. This picture actually came from, I think, here, here, uh, Might Magic 6, where we had, a, we had, a, they had a group of townspeople that would give a thumbs up or thumbs down to your quests. And, uh, and uh, I was one of the townspeople in that game. I don't own this costume. I'm sorry, I don't own the hat. This is a, this is a cosplay outfit from uh, one of our artists that they had me wear for this. I keep thinking I, I should make a copy of the hat to, uh, to wear, but uh, it's one of a, a number of other heroes that, uh, that based upon uh, New World Computing folks. Craig Hack is a character that is in all, uh, all of the Heroes of My Magic games. It's based upon uh, John Van Canham's Dungeons & Dragons character. Sir Christian is based on assistant producer Sir Christian. Anitis, based upon concept artist George Almond. And Galu, who is the hero of Armageddon's Blade, is based upon our animator, um, Andrew McCarthy. So we did a number of different expansions to the game. I know I'm, I'm running over long. I apologize for that. I hear, I hear people talking on the outside. We did a number of expansions. They, 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 they did well. Then came Heroes 4. Um, how many of you like Heroes 4 more than my Magic? Really? <laughs> a lot of people tell me that it's much worse. I could spend another hour talking about Heroes 4 and all the problems we had with that. Everything on Heroes 3 went perfectly. It was a pleasure. This, this was miserable to work on because the team kept fighting. We, we, we lost... Uh, Greg Fulton and George Bolton had quit the company because they had issues with the management. Uh, Phelan was assigned to a different project. I brought in some new people. They had different ideas. I, although I think the biggest change to it, the uh, reason why some people don't like Heroes 4, is always a challenge when you make a sequel. You have to, what do you keep from the original, previous versions that people liked but change it enough to make it worth buying the sequel. That's always a tough decision. My idea was to take the hero, I mean, it's called Heroes of Might and Magic, not Generals of Might and Magic. Let's put the heroes on the battlefield and have them fight. Turns out by doing that, it made it more of a role-playing type of game uh, than it was before. Some people liked it, some people didn't. Um, I was, uh, I was, uh, I, most people tell me they, did, they didn't like the game, but I attended a, a LARP meeting the other night here in, in Kiev. And, uh, and one of the LARPers told me that Heroes 4 isn't worse than Heroes 3, it's just different. And I wanted to hug her for saying that. Yeah, it's a, it's a different game, um, but not quite as, uh, it doesn't quite have the love that Heroes of My Magic 3 does. So, legacy since then. Um, I'm shocked that you guys still remember this game. I mean, this is like over 20 years ago. Um, people still have me sign autographs for it. Sir Mullock is a popular creature, uh, character. Um, they Ubisoft bought the franchise when 3, uh, 3DO went out of business. They've been continuing the Heroes of My Magic series. Sir Mullock still is a character in the game. They, they send me uh, copies of the artwork of Sir Mullock uh, every once in a while. I discovered some, uh, uh, this, I think this is from a Russian artist on DeviantArt um, of Sir Mullock. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just delighted by it. Um, it's great to be a video game character, 
And as such, I, I often represent Heroes of My Magic 3 to a lot of you. I did want to remind everyone here today of all the great people that worked on the game. It, uh, it was a team effort, and uh, I'm, I'm really considering myself blessed to have worked with so many great people. Um, still friends with a lot of them. John, uh, we meet up with each, uh, each other every once in a while. John Van Canham, Mark Caldwell, my bosses at, at, uh, at, uh, at New World Computing. We had, some, we, we had some rough times together, particularly during the development of Heroes of My Magic 4, but uh, we now all look back at, at those being very fond times. One thing before I go, we're, we're finally at the end. I know everyone probably wants to go to lunch or something. Um, I wanted to tell you something that Greg Fulton, the, designers, the lead designer of Hero Might Magic 3, is working on. He's working on a game that, called Fanstratix, combination of fantasy, strategy, and tactics. He calls it a spiritual successor to Heroes of Might and Magic 3. It's something he's developing on his own. And uh, some of the features to it, I have to refer to it. He and I talk a lot about the game. Um, he's released a lot about it. Uh, he's told me more than what he's released. Um, uh, I like what I hear, but I can't say everything. Here's what I can say about it. It's going to have nine playable factions. It will have base and alternate tr true types. There's going to be a true rally ability in it that, that as you fight, uh, there will be a rally energy that builds up that you can use to, to, to give as a bonus to your fighting later on. Uh, there's going to be player-determined weekly events, battlefield artifacts, artifact upgrade system, legendary boss battles, uh, experience potions. It will eventually have two or three campaigns and 45 solo maps, a hardcore mode, community map editor. It's still in the, the early phases of development. If you're at all interested in it and you're a fan of, of, of uh, Greg's work, go to fanstratix.com and you can sign up for the newsletter that's following it. I, I know I'm following it uh, very closely and, uh, and, and I'm supporting it. And that is it for my talk. That's how Heroes 3 came to be made. Thank you for, for being such a attentive audience.